All right, let's get started, you guys. Welcome and good morning. I know it's hard to fight over the music. <laughs> Since we're at a disco, we're gonna turn the lights off and that ball's gonna drop. All right, you guys, we're gonna get started. Welcome and good morning to everybody here. Uh, I'm, wow, we've got a nice handful of guys here this morning. It must be the burritos that we're going to have. They don't know what's in them. <laughs> you guys don't know what's in them. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby, back up a little bit, bro. <laughs> Lightning's going to probably come down pretty soon. Iron Brinstone. He's going to stand up. I want to welcome the guys that are joining us online this morning. Uh, I heard Rick Vasquez isn't feeling well, uh, so we're going to lift up Rick in prayer. Uh, somebody told me, though, that he may be in his bunny slippers. I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, but, Rick, if you're in your bunny slippers, God bless you. We're going to pray for you, bro. Uh, Rodney, thank you for joining us online. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. And and I'm excited. You know, I'm always... it's Tuesday morning's hard, man. It's hard to get up, right? And it's hard to get up early, and, and I've been going to bed late on Tuesday evenings, like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's late. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, but you know, when you get here and we're amongst the guys, it it's, it's just makes it all worth it, man. And we get to spend time in God's Word, and if you're here from the Spirit and, and fellowship, you know, the greatest thing that we have here is God's Word. But afterwards, we have burritos, and they're getting, they're. Ground beef. Yeah, praise God for the burritos. Manna from heaven. You know, so, uh, so it's good to see you guys here. And uh, But why don't we open up in prayer? Uh, Ray, God bless you. Ray is watching. Ray, God bless you, Ray. And uh, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace and for allowing us to gather here this morning and to hear from your word. May your spirit speak to us, Lord. May we be men of God. And I'm thankful for these men. I'm thankful for them getting up early and making the sacrifice to come out and hear your word, Lord. For the guys that got here early to set up and to make breakfast, Lord. The guys that rolled the burritos, Lord. Uh, the guys that cooked the meat, uh, all of them, Lord. May your hand be a blessing upon them. And so, Lord, as we take this moment to spend some time in your word, may you be glorified and honored in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in first, uh, Second Kings chapter 13. We got through some of the chapter last week, but I want to do a little bit of a recap and then wrap up the chapter. But you know what's so amazing about this chapter is God's grace and mercy. I don't know if any of you have experienced God's grace and mercy, but I can tell you in my life, I have. I can tell you that, as I've shared before, that at one time I was shot out, drug addict, loser. Uh, you name it, I was it. And, and to a point where God's mercy and grace transforms lives. And we know that God's in the business of transforming lives up until this day. This is why it's so important not to quit praying for your brother, your sister, your prodigal, your wife, your husband. Uh, never to stop praying for our families. Because it's God's grace and mercy that will transform. And we're going to see a little bit of that today. But we're also going to, we've been looking at this king named Joash. And Joash has been uh, the king of Judah. And uh, he's the son of a man called Joahaz. So we just call him Joash for short. He's been the one that has been, we've been looking at in chapter 13. And he was the one that was actually raised by Jehoiada the priest. Remember with me that as he was being raised up, he was hidden, just like we knew that Moses was hidden. He was hidden for a purpose. And, and this is kind of where I want to make an application early on. It's not like you guys are being hidden. But God has a plan for you. And God's timing for his plan to it reveal in your lives may not always be our timing. But there's a time where he will put you away to train you up and to raise you up. And a lot of times in that place, we become either complacent or we become impatient. Well, Lord, I finished Bible college. I got to get out there and preach to the world. 
Oh, Lord, I got this, this zeal in my heart. I got to get out there. And sometimes we, we begin to push the envelope for God. And then we are premature in, in the calling that God called us to do. But here we get a picture of God's perfect timing. Because it was in time when God had put, allowed Joash to be hidden until a certain time. And then he was raised up. And I think that's a great application for us men to understand that God has called you for a specific purpose. Well, you may say, well, John, I don't speak well. Well, e e e either do I. I don't have eloquent words. Well, neither do I. But maybe God hasn't called you to come up and speak. Maybe God just called you to live your life that is set apart for him. What a testimony that is. Maybe God has called you to be the, the godly husband, the godly uh, Never mind the godly wife. <laughs> Maybe. You can go to the church down the street. And our women's ministry is always taking applications, you guys. But God has called each and every one of you. It may not be, be behind a pulpit. But we're all called to be a witness and a testimony for our Savior. In the back, you guys, we have leftover bracelets. I put mine on and it looked like I put her on a, a ring of chorizo, you guys. It was so tight around my wrist. But they stretch out. But on there it says set apart. And it's a good reminder for me every time that I feel that God's not doing a work in my life. I just happen to glance down and it says set apart. That God has set us apart as men to do his work. But oftentimes in this work that God has called us to do... We will fail in a lot of areas. And the number one place where we will begin to fail is when we allow the high places in our hearts to begin to take over the worship of God. And this is what we see with Joash. We see that he did right in the eyes of the Lord. He was raised with the testimony of the first five books of the Old Testament. And so he was at a young age set apart to bring about the Davidic dynasty remaining in Judah. But it was, the, it was the, the evil queen mother that was trying to destroy that line. And this is why he was in hiding. So once he becomes king, he's anointed king, he's given the Old Testament, he goes and he begins to repair the temple. And we're like, what an amazing king. He's now going to repair the house of God. And, and I started looking about in my life, you guys. I, I try to do a lot of self-examination in my own life to remind me how unqualified I am. You know, I, I, wrote, a, I wrote out uh, the, the attributes of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus 1. And I was so discouraged, I didn't meet anything on that list. I think the only one I met was not giving in to wine. And I'm thinking, I'm not hospitable. I don't like people coming over. Uh, uh, what, was, uh, what, what are some of, the godly, some of the godly characteristics? Above reproach? Well, God has allowed me to be above reproach. But oftentimes, I, I think I think in my own reproach, I think sometimes I sell myself short. So to be set apart for God is so key for us men. We got young guys here. What a great testimony to be set apart. And so as this king now begins to repair this temple, he repairs the outside of it. It looks beautiful. But the one thing he fails to do where we begin to see his heart of worship starting to decline is that he did not address or repair or replace the articles of worship and sacrifice in the temple. Don't we know that our lives are a temple of the Holy Spirit? And our life every single day is to worship our Creator. Every single day our lives are set apart to reflect God's glory and forgiveness in our lives. Every single day. Every message that we give to others shall always point to God's mercy and God's grace. But when we begin to mess with the 
tools of worship and we begin to remove the, the, the tools of sacrifice, we begin to replace it with another kind of sacrifice and worship. And it's usually idol worshiping. Yes, John, praise God for all the Lord has removed those big idols in your life. But what about those things that we hang on to? That we are that are our go-to sin when we're stressed. Some of it it's lust, perversion, pride. And these are the things that can begin to worship in the temple of the Holy Spirit of our lives. And the next thing you know is that we're not worshiping the true God. We are now worshiping me. And if there's one thing that will bring a man to a spiraling downfall, it is when worship of the true living God has been replaced with other things in our lives. And from that point there, it's just a matter of time before God's judgment will come as we've seen on Mount Carmel, choose today who you will serve between the two Baals and God. We have a choice, men. And we have to be the men that decide every single day that our lives are going to be lived out for the Lord. So as soon as this, this king begins to build this temple, his, his, uh, his mentor, Jehoiada, dies. And when Jehoiada dies, the true heart of Joash, no accountability, no connection with his mentor is now gone and he begins to bring in carved wooden images. How dare you, Joash? How could you even do that? After everything that God has done in your life, after everything that God has shown you, the, the testimony of God that you were with, I mean, that we look at that and we say, how despicable. But the same thing can happen in our own lives. And we can allow these things to come up. And we see that as he began to follow wrong examples, he found himself spiraling out of control. So we pick up here in verse 10. Where it says, in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Joash, the son of Joahaz, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned 16 years. Now, a little bit of a confusion because there was a Joash that reigned in Judah. And it was a, now there's a Joash that reigns in Israel. Two different, it would be like uh, us Mexicans, right? <clears throat> Does anybody in your family, Mexican families, have a sister and aunt named Maria? Everyone does. You got one too, Kenneth? I knew it, bro. The truth comes out. I knew it. <laughs> Joash is a common name in that time. And, uh, and so Joash was the leader of Judah in the 27th year, in the 37th year. Uh, Joash, the son of Joash, became king over Israel and Samaria. So remember the nations, the, the, the country has been split. Mostly because of idol worshiping. <laughs> and the first thing that tells us here uh, about this man, this new king in Samaria, which follows suit of all the kings of Samaria, is that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. But what kind of evil did he do? Because we've been looking at two greater evils with the kings that have been introducing idol worshiping into the, into the nation of Israel, particularly Samaria. Remember with me that it was Jezebel that brought in the worship of Baal. She is a Sidonian that brought in the, the rain god, the fertile god, and the sex god all tied into one. And this was very appealing to Ahab so much that he began to lead the people in this type of worship. When we have a heart that is moved to something that will bring us pleasure, we have to be careful, men, of what kind of worship it truly is. Because it can be a worship that leads to self-pleasure and gratification. Then, we're, then there's that spirit of Baal that we're leaning towards, or the spirit of Ashtoreth. 
And we have to be very careful that our heart for the Lord is for our true and only Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here in verse 11 that he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam. Now remember with me, Jeroboam was the king of the north. And a prophet had come to Jeroboam and said, look, I'm going to tell you something. See this robe I'm wearing? I'm going to tear it up. I'm going to tear it up into 10 pieces, and I'm going to give you 10 pieces, and I'm going to give the king of Judah two, which really only turned out to be one. And this is going to represent the tribes of north. We reference it as Israel. This one, two, is going to represent Judah. And this prophet tells Jeroboam, because Jeroboam was under King Rehoboam in the south, and Rehoboam started tripping. And so Jeroboam was like, I'm out of here. And while he was on his journey, a prophet approaches Jeroboam and says to him, look, you're going to be king of the north. When you become king, if you walk in, in the Lord's ways and walk in his statutes and his commandments, he will place his name on your kingdom. And Jeroboam's like, whoa, wait, this is crazy. What? Yes, all you have to do is walk in the statutes of the Lord, obey his commandments, walk in his ways, do not depart from evil, do not depart from the Lord, and the Lord will put his name on your kingdom. You're like, well, that's great. Jehovah God's name is going to be on my kingdom? No question about it, right? But then Jeroboam tells us in 1 Kings chapter 9, he began to say in his heart. See, man, that's where we mess up. We hear God's promises all the time. You are more than conqueror. You shall overcome. I will neither, neither leave you nor forsake you. We have all these promises in, in the Bible that God gives to us men, but oftentimes we begin to listen to our hearts and we think we have it better. Or we think we can do it better. And Jeroboam began to set up idol worshiping because he began to listen to his heart. This is what it talks about here when he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam. The sins between Jeroboam and the sins of Ahab are different. Jeroboam, his worship looked like worship to the Lord. It sounded like worship to the Lord. There were temples that even looked like worship of the Lord, but it wasn't worship of the Lord. Everything, he had his priest, he had everything set up. It was a counterfeit worship. And what he does, instead of putting a place where the Lord would be worshipped, he set up two golden calves. And the people began to depart from worshipping Jehovah God and began to worship these golden calves. It says here in verse 11 that he made Israel sin. You know what's important, men? That what you worship your children, your wives, your family are going to follow. This is why it's so important, men, that we're always spending time in God's word. It's so important that we are in fellowship. It's so important that we attend church because we are setting an example to our children and to our wives by what we are worshiping. Some of us are worshiping other things that take the place of the true worship of God. And so it's not just us that falls into that sin of worship. It ultimately affects our entire families and those all around us. So if I was asked you guys this morning, what is it you worship? Now, the super spiritual dudes will say, Jesus, brother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But if we're real with ourselves, because this is an area I struggle with too. Sometimes it can be music. It's never golfing. I haven't golfed in so long, you guys. I think if I even pick up a golf club, I would don't know what to do with it. But it can be centered around me. And here's an example. A few weeks ago, probably like a month or two ago, uh, my wife was at work. And it really convicted me. Because it was about me and, and, it was a, and it was a picture of how I can take my wife for granted. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. And we, uh, she was working late, so I, I told her, hey, I'm going to take the kids. We're going to go get something to eat. And when we came back, uh, when we're, we had ordered, I said, you want me to take the food home? No, no, I'll, I'll be leaving in 10 minutes. 
Well, I'm one of these guys, you tell me you're gonna be in 10 minutes, I expect you in 10 minutes. I don't expect 25, 30 minutes. So she says, then I get a text, on my way. Well, that was like around, now this time we were at the restaurant a long time, so I'm getting, I'm getting a little restless. The kids have eaten, now we're just sitting there. We could just went home. So that was about 10 to three. About 3.35, she rolls up and she walks in. I said, just leaving? And so then I get quiet. If I get upset, I get quiet. And she's like, what's wrong with you? You told me that you were just leaving. It doesn't take 40, 35 minutes to get here from, it's a Sunday, there's no traffic. I was concerned for you. <sighs> You guys never know. I'm sure you don't. If you translate it, it's. And she convicted me because I, I began to get upset. And, and then I realized that I'm worshiping me in a lot of ways. And she said this, and, and you guys, this is what hit me. She says, you're making a big deal about this. I told you I was sorry. She said, if it was Pastor David or anything to do with the church, you would have a smile on your face. All of a sudden I went, I'm happy. <laughs> she was right. She was right. And I was convicted. And it allowed me to step back and say, John, what is it in my life that I have put in the way for me to be able to worship the Lord that has not allowed me to minister to my wife? What are those things? Because so easily, men, we can come home from a long day at work and we can plop ourselves in front of the TV or we can plop ourselves in front of the computer and the next thing you know, we have spent no time with our wives and kids. I've done that many times and I've had to step back and say, I have a heart that is leaning towards a worship of Jeroboam because it looks like I'm worshiping the Lord. It sounds like I'm worshiping the Lord, but when it comes down to it, I was worshiping me. And men, we have to be very on guard against that. So what is it that you worship this morning? I mean, coffee is a close run, you guys. <laughs> we have to be mindful of this. So what we see here now as we continue is that this Joash in verse 12, he dies. Before he dies, it says he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah. Aren't they not written in the book of Chronicles? You can find that in that battle in 2 Chronicles, uh, actually uh, 2 Kings 14, 8 through 15. We'll see that down the road. So it says he rested 13 in, with his fathers. And then we see Jeroboam. Now this is not the same Jeroboam. We briefly last week covered this. This is a different Jeroboam. This is Jeroboam's son, Jeroboam II. But he's briefly mentioned. Notice how he's only briefly mentioned. Notice there's no reference to who's reigning as, as, the, as the writer always sets up. Notice that his mom's name's not given. And you notice that it doesn't give the reign of the opposite king who's in Judah. You notice that. The writer is doing this intentionally because later on, we're going to take a look at this and we're going to be able to distinguish what Jeroboam 1 has done, the golden calf worship, and Jeroboam 2. So the writer is very intentional when not mentioning this is, is going, what was going on. But notice with me in verse 14, it says that Elisha had become sick. Now we're not quite sure the illness is, we haven't seen Elisha since chapter 9, and all of a sudden he's back on the scene. And Elisha, we, we covered this last week, gives him something because he's going to Elisha because Syria is now agitated, and they're going to attack Samaria. And so what's interesting is that Joash knows to go to a man of God. And this is where I want to put just another application on this man. Do people recognize you as a man of God? Do they know they can come to you when they're in crisis? 
Or are they the ones that will say to you, I didn't know you were a Christian. You go to church? Or are you that man that is a pillar in the Lord that when people are in crisis, they look to you because you will point them to Jesus? Again, men, it's all about the worship. Because if you're not worshiping the true God in your heart, you're never going to be pointing people to Jesus. You're going to be pointing them to you. This is why it's so important that we always examine our hearts to see if there's anything that has risen itself up to take the place of the worship of Jehovah God. So we see that he, uh, he's sick and, and, be, and, and uh, he says, hey, before you die, help me out. So we see in verses, I won't read it, uh, 15, 16, and 17, and 18, we see him do this kind of amazing, weird thing. Now remember, the king of, uh, the king of Syria is hot on their tail. And they're going about to go into war. And so Joash probably has all his weapons and his arrows ready together to go to battle. And Elisha tells him, first thing I want you to do is open up the east window and I just want you to randomly shoot an arrow. What? These are the arrows I have for war. These are the ones I have to fight with. And you're wanting me to do what? You're wanting me to open up the window and just shoot an arrow randomly? Elisha, don't, don't you know I need this arrow? Don't you know this is part of my, my weapons to fight against the wicked king of Syria? And you're wanting me to shoot? Okay. Opens up the eastern window, shoots a bow randomly. The Lord tells him, with that bow, the Lord will deliver your nation of Israel over Syria. See, man, when God asks us to do something that doesn't seem logical, know that his ways are greater than our ways. And we may think, Lord, but I need that arrow. I need to use that to fight. Last time I checked in scripture, it says the Lord will fight our battles. Then he tells them another thing. Take the arrows in verse 15, or take a bow and take some arrows. <coughs> and then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. We remember reading that. Open the eastern gate, shoot the arrow. And it says the Lord of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. That random arrow wasn't random. There was an intent and purpose for it. Anything that God has asked you to do, there's always, rather how illogical it may seem, there's always an intent and purpose for it, what he's asked you to call. Has he asked you to open up the east window and shoot out an arrow? Maybe he's asked you to take a step of faith today. Maybe you were working on a project and you're stuck. And he's saying, you know what, just shoot that arrow. Let me show you what I'm going to do. Maybe you're at an impasse in your marriage. Maybe you're in an impasse in your relationships. Maybe you're in a place where, Lord, I don't know what to do. And the Lord's instructing you, you know, you trust me, open up that window and shoot. Be proactive. And we see that this arrow was going to deliver the, uh, the, the Israelites from the Syrians. But in verse 18, he says, take the arrows. Now, I find that interesting. He didn't take some arrows, as he's mentioned uh, beforehand. He said he'd take some, uh, some of the arrows that he had mentioned in verse 15. Those are just random arrows. Take some arrows and get them out there and shoot towards the east. Here, notice the prophet's instruction is more direct, more clear. Take the arrows. Now, I find that interesting. Because it, it seems to be here that these arrows are designated for something, which is probably war. Because they're going to fight the Syrians and they probably have slingshots and, and bow and arrows. They don't have 30 out six and AK 15s like some of you guys have. <laughs> Man, some, some guys from our church went to uh, shooting. <laughs> I've never seen so many felons with guns in my life. 
We could have called ice and uh, swine. Right? <laughs> so he takes these arrows. He tells, take the, take the arrows. They're designated, yes, for war. But I want you to take these arrows. And I want you to shoot them into the ground. So Elisha, we're in battle. I don't know if you know this. We're going to war. This is why I'm coming to you. And now you just had me shoot an arrow to the east. And now you're asking me to, in verse 18, strike the ground. So you're asking me to take my bow and arrow, my arrows, the one I'm going to use against the Syrians, and you're wanting me to strike the ground? Doesn't make sense, Lord. Doesn't make sense. I need these arrows for battle. I need these arrows to shoot. I need them to be that, that fly right. Hitting the ground's gonna mess them up. I might not even be able to use them again. Strike the ground. So in verse 18, it says that he took him and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck it three times and stopped. That guy has more faith than I would because I would have done it once. <laughs> But he did it three times. And it tells us in verse 19 that the man of God was angry. He was angry at him because he said, you should have struck it five or six times. Well, why didn't you tell me? Why wouldn't you share with me? He was testing his faith. He was testing his heart. You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck the Syrians until you have destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. You know what this is a picture of, you guys? Verse 19. Lukewarmness. This man had been worshiping other gods. This man now comes to the Lord because he's in trouble. This man was playing flip-flop. Jesus tells us in the book of Revelation, I would wish you were neither hot nor cold. But you are lukewarm. I will what? I will vomit you out of my mouth. There can be a lot of lukewarm Christians playing God today, men. And it all begins in the heart of worship. See, this lukewarmness was demonstrated by not trusting into the prophet, by shooting the arrows in the ground. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if I would have been able to shoot those arrows in the ground. I don't know if I even would have done it or stopped. But it's an indication here of a lukewarmness. And it tells us the result of lukewarmness is that this man was angry at him. So I think sometimes we can get away thinking we can be lukewarm when it's arousing the anger of God. Then Elisha died, it tells us in verse 20. They buried him and, and now these raiding bands from Moab began to set their hearts and attack to Israel. The king is gone. We're going to start raiding because they had heard that Hazael took all the gold and silver from the temple. They're going to get a piece of this as well. They're going to get in on the action. And so Elisha dies. The prophet of God dies. See the importance and impact that this man has? So much that when he dies, Moab now starts to come into action thinking that they can get theirs. And so they begin to invade the, in the land of the year. Now, tw verse 21 is a little interesting because it doesn't give us a time frame. But now it moves us into a funeral. Doesn't tell us who. It doesn't tell us what significance this man was. It just references as a man. Now, if you read too quickly through it, we can think he's talking about Elisha. But Elisha has already been buried. Elisha would have been wrapped and placed in a tomb. Usually what they would have done is lowered him into a tomb and sealed it or left it half sealed for other men of God that would die. But look what it says here. It, it, the tense kind of throws me off because it says here in verse 21, so it was as they were burying a man. So the scene changes to a funeral and a man significant enough to be placed in the, in the same tomb of Elisha tells us that this was a prominent man. But the Bible does not mention who it is. 
And it's interesting, as it says here, is that when <coughs> when they, uh, oh, I lost my place, uh, that, as they were bearing a man, suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in uh, in the tomb of Elisha. So that gives us a little bit of more insight. Could have been like, okay, let's put him in the tomb of Elisha for right now. We got some raiders coming, but a man so significant enough that they didn't want this body to be ripped off. So the writer's given us a little bit of hints of what's going on here. There was a funeral. Now, the funeral must have been hastened because they knew the band of raiders were coming for Moab. So they wanted to get this person buried. And literally, it says when they, when they, uh, when the man was let down, it, what the picture is that they would tie a rope and they would throw them in the hole. So they were just a plume. There, that tells us that there was some haste to this. But what's even interesting is what we see here in the same verse. It says, when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood at his feet. What would you guys do? I saw, I was sharing with Ray. I tried to send it to you, Jeff. I couldn't get it over to you. This, this girl is holding a doll. It's like one of those live dolls that blink and scary doll, right? And this, this girl speaking Spanish to her, oh, what a cute little doll you are. And, and how cute. And the doll says, you're not cute. But the way the doll looked at her and like her head turned, man, it gave me goosebumps, man. <laughs> it scared me. I can't stand dolls. <laughs> but imagine the body hits, boom. It touches Elisha. And this man stands at his feet. Amazing. It's not indicated who, what, significance, but what's the application, men? And we're going to wrap up with this, and then I'll just read the rest. See, men, when, when we have a worship for God in our lives, and our hearts are worshiping the Lord, and we're in God's word, that anybody who comes in contact with us will receive the life of Jesus Christ. Anybody who just comes in contact with our lives, they will know that they've had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Can we really say that today, men? Can somebody come up and say, you know what, I ran into Jeff. And you know what, I see Jesus in him. His life has been touched because his heart's in a place of worship. Or they just say, oh, that dude's a fool. Can people say when they contact your circle they, that, they, that they see Jesus in you? Or do they see legalism? Or do they see lust? Or do they see pride? Or do they see, I'm better than you? Or do they see Jesus? See, men, as men of God at Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, we want, the, we want our men to be so in love with Jesus, to have Jesus the center of their lives, that anybody that contacts them, even those around us who are dead, will receive life. And they will say to you, what is it, brother, about you? It's Jesus. Or are we too busy saying, I don't like the color of shirt he wears, we need to get him out of the church. See, the woman that had the issue of blood, there was a group of them trying to keep her away from Jesus. And we can be the same way. Get away, you're defiled. Get away, you're bleeding. Get away, you're this. Get away. And she says, all I have to do is just touch his hand. Are we that same way? Or we're like, no, you know what? Your shirt's too pink. Your backpack is too, your hair is too, and we begin to push away people from Jesus. The woman with the issue of blood came and fell and touched the hem of the garment. And he turns to her and says, daughter, you have been made well. Are people able, able to, well, not call you daughter, but are they able, able to encounter Jesus when they come up against you? Because we can be so pharisaical at times that we begin pushing people away. We see this man lowered Actually thrown in a tomb, 
he touches the body of Elisha and he stood the life of man. That would be, what did he do after he stood up? We know he died again. But in Christ, we know that we live forever. And so it says in verse 22, and Hazael king of uh, has all king of Syria oppressed all the days of jo Joaz, but the Lord was gracious to them, had compassion on them, and regarded them because of his own covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them or cast them from his presence. Now Hezael, king of Syria, died, and Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his place. And Joash, the son of Joaz, recaptured the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hezael, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Joahaz, his father by war, three times Joash defeated him and recaptured the cities of Israel. He struck the ground three times, and three times there was a victory. Men, we can strike the well any time of Christ. We have a privilege to worship our King. We have access to the Lord at any time. And not only that, his spirit dwells within us. And because his spirit dwells in us, when people come around us, they would see Jesus. Not you, not your wife, not your kids, not pushing them away from Jesus, but that they would see Jesus glorified in your lives. Men, are we living in such a manner because if we're not, then I would say we need to examine our hearts to see where our worship is. And if there are places in your life, men, that have been raised up against the Lord, cast them down, strike them down, and murder them. Because if you won't, they'll rear its ugly head again, and you will see something like this take place. Amen? Maybe we always be men of God that when people come in contact with us, they see Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace. We thank you for the brothers that are here, Lord, that are taking the time to come hear your word. Lord, may the word even today permeate in their lives and their hearts and their minds. Lord, maybe there was something here that stood out to them that they can chew on all day. But Lord, may it bring transformation in our lives. May we examine our hearts, Lord, to, to see that worship only belongs to you. So, Lord, uh, thank you for giving us the privilege to share your word. Lord, we lift up our pastor this morning and Marie and the entire family as we prepare for midweek services tomorrow. And, Lord, thank you for our church. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for these men that have gotten here early to hear your word. Bless them and anoint them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys, God bless you.